So this is the ninth in our series of, of 10, and we're looking today at the subject of how to share faith with, with patients. And I hope that this will be practical and helpful to you as, as we go through. And in the same way as with past sessions, I, I'll speak to this for about half an hour or so, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. So the aims of the session, I'm just going to introduce you to the saline process tool. Some of you may be familiar with that already. To understand that medicine and dentistry give unique opportunities to share faith and why that is. To understand the barriers that exist both in ourselves and also in our patients to the sharing of faith. To know five keys to spiritual influence, all of which begin with the letter C, to make them easier to remember and then to look at four useful tools in, in sharing faith. And pretty much everything I'm going to say is based on a teaching tool called the Saline Process, which was developed about uh, 25 years ago, originally by CMDA US, uh, at CMDA's United States uh, membership group. And then it was redeveloped and packaged for international use by a group called IHS, the IHS uh, Global Group, as it's now known, International Healthcare Services. And back in the early noughties, we put together a group of 10 organizations of which ICMDA was one in order to roll out this training around the world to help Christian doctors and dentists, students and other healthcare professionals to be able to share their faith naturally in the context of uh, a consultation. And so the International Saline Partnership consists of these 10 organizations who together using this tool called the Saline Process with the support of IHS Global, who are based in the US, are training healthcare workers around the globe to answer God's call to be a witness. And as you'll know, ICMDA's vision is a Christian witness through doctors and dentists in every community and in every nation. So this is a very important part of the ministry that we do. Now, uh, You'll, if you want to read about how the Salon process works, there's a very good article in Triple Helix, which is the magazine of the Christian Medical Fellowship of the UK. And you should have that link already in uh, the notes that we sent around with the contents of this course. And you can read it on the website or download it as a PDF. You can see it's quite short and it'll give you a good overview. <clears throat> and we, uh, we're not going to look at everything because the whole course would take really a whole day, at least eight hours to do properly with a lot of interactive stuff as well. So we're going to pick some of the important parts out of it. But being a doctor or a dentist gives you a unique opportunity to be able to, to share faith. And uh, Francis Grimm, the founder of the Healthcare Christian Fellowship International, uh, is well known and well quoted for saying that every week more people walk through the doors of hospitals than through the doors of churches. That's really true. Many people who would never uh, go to a church will nonetheless meet a Christian healthcare professional in the course of their life. And uh, he also says, when you're healthy, you look out horizontally, but if you're sick and lying down, you look up vertically to God. And so often when we're sick, and suffering we're asking questions and we're in a position where we're perhaps more open to seek spiritual answers to those questions than if we were well now doctors are really in a privileged position you, you just think about it uh, some of these things are true about dentists as well but more than any other profession the doctor has personal access to an influence in the individual's life a perfect stranger will undress at your request I mean, that's, that's quite incredible, isn't it? You go and the doctor says, uh, go behind that curtain and take your clothes off. And you, you wouldn't do it for anyone else in the world other than perhaps your, your wife or husband. Patients will tell you what they wouldn't tell anyone else. It might be the deepest feelings or symptoms of which they're ashamed or afraid. People come to you at crisis moments in their lives. And uh, you know, often the, the greatest crises in our lives are around issues of health when we're worried about what's going to happen and they put their very lives in your hands. I know this as a, a general surgeon having operated on thousands of people that uh, these people don't even know you but they trust you and they put their lives literally in your hands to be able to fix their problems 
and this is all about the trust that comes with the with the uh, profession so they trust you they will wait for you and not get angry they'll let you interrupt their lives they'll be put up with all sorts of inconvenience to see you they make major lifestyle changes because you said so you should stop smoking you should get more exercise you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't uh, eat so much fat or whatever uh, other people don't get away with saying these things but but we can they grant you credibility before you've even earned it because you have dr in front of your name and you meet them when god is already at work often at times in their lives when they're more open so there are real opportunities and uh, let's just think about the process of evangelism because it has different parts to it and there, there is first of all uh, cultivating and cultivating is really about breaking down the barriers that people might have to the gospel or to knowing god and the saline process course is really pretty much about cultivating it's the very first stage of breaking down barriers and then sowing is speaking to the mind that's the whole area of apologetics where we're answering questions that people might have um, intellectual objections to the christian faith why does god allow suffering uh, how can uh, uh, what about evolution how do we know the bible's true isn't faith all psychological those those sort of things and then harvesting is speaking to the will which is really when a person decides to make a decision to give their life to to christ but there's a whole process involved from cultivating through to harvesting and often in people this will take many years sometimes decades sometimes a whole lifetime to progress along and i think that's really important for us to know because it's not that every person we're going to speak to is going to become a believer there and then, but we have the privilege of perhaps being able to move them a little bit closer to that place. And so the process of evangelism is a process usually prolonged, as I said, it could be many, many years of guiding an unbeliever in the power of the Spirit, because it's something that God does and acts at every uh, part of that process in making a multitude of many decisions. The, the big decision to give oneself to Christ is often after a whole lot of many decisions, which might have involved perhaps, uh, you know, agreeing to read a book or uh, listen to a speaker or ask a question or go to a church or something that result in the overcoming of many obstacles towards placing his or her faith in Christ. So it's recognizing that this journey is a kind of obstacle course where people have to negotiate hurdles along the way and before we start we need to really think about three really important things that when we're dealing with patients often at a vulnerable time in their lives uh, but at all, in all circumstances we have to first of all be sensitive and gentle uh, towards them we need to speak if we get the opportunity only with permission we never take advantage of or exploit the power we might have in the relationship and we do it always with respect knowing that our patients however difficult we may find them are nonetheless men or women made in the image of god uh, for a relationship with god so sensitivity permission and respect spr are the three cautions that we take place uh, what we take care of uh, using and then there are five questions that the saline process course addresses why is faith important in healthcare? And they look there at the evidence that faith leads to much better outcomes and uh, better health generally. How it's uh, often spiritual questions are wrapped up with people's physical health. Questions about meaning and purpose may affect the way that they are operating in the world. Then what are the opportunities for and the barriers to fulfilling God's call? We've looked a little bit at the opportunities. We're going to look at the barriers what is my part particularly what kind of doctor or dentist is going to be effective in this and then what tools will help me to cultivate so and harvest and where do i go from here so in the saline process course you would do this over a whole day or in a mini saline course over a couple of hours or so and you can and i'd encourage you when you get the opportunity if you haven't done it already to go to one of these courses that are being put on all over the world by different organizations including icmda 
<coughs> but uh, and also you can do the course online what's called spot which is an acronym for saline process online training spot and you can go to the ihs global website uh, google saline process ihs global and you'll find that you can do the whole course online there through through videos in much more detail than we can possibly do today so this is what we're going to look at barriers in us and our patients the five keys to spiritual influence four tools that we can use as well that we'll go through quickly that should really give you enough practical demonstration to be able to, to incorporate them and use them yourself so let's think about uh, barriers in the doctor's life first of all and um, there are many lack of time is um, a big one 71 percent that's the one that people come up with most and the thing to realize here is that it doesn't actually take much time to witness in the context of the medical consultation it's not adding much time at all it's more a matter of how to do it and how to incorporate it into your normal life not creating extra burdens for you uncertainty about how to take a spiritual history we'll talk about that 59 percent identify the patients who desire discussion and that's uh, about spiritual discernment on at one level but also judging from the verbal and non-verbal cues as to whether it's appropriate how to manage spiritual issues what what happens if you if you uh, discover something in the course of a consultation but you don't know actually how to deal it with it have you uh, opened a whole can of worms as we would say lack of experience or training and just as we train in uh, every aspect of medicine or surgery so we need specific training in this as well that these are these are learned skills <clears throat> concern i will project my beliefs for we've already talked about sensitivity and permission difficulty using the appropriate language so we need to learn how to express spiritual truths in a language that people will understand to de-jargonize what we say and then there's the negative attitude of our peers and i think this is a much bigger fear than most people think you know if i talk about my faith there's going to be a complaint about me i'll be struck off the medical register or someone i'll be up before the general medical council or whatever and i i'm afraid that this keeps a lot of people silent when in actual fact if they were operating with sensitivity permission and respect and only opening only going through the doors that the holy spirit himself is opening uh, these problems are much less common although we should also remind ourselves that we do have a spiritual enemy uh, in the in satan and the evil one who is not going to want us to be able to talk about faith in the context of uh, our practice so let's uh, think about barriers in the patient's life first of all and you can see there are lots of different kinds here so there are emotional barriers maybe uh, fear maybe a bad experience they've had with a church or a christian in the past someone they knew who was hypocritical or uh, uncompassionate then there's intellectual barriers, the big questions that people ask that stop them accepting a Christian worldview. There's volitional barriers, which are about matters of the will, just not willing to take that step of faith. And then there are spiritual barriers because, as we've said already, there are spiritual forces involved. And as the Bible tells us, the God of this world, the devil, blinds the minds of unbelievers. So they need the Holy Spirit to open them. And then there are cultural barriers as well different understandings of medicine and and health that um, especially when we're working cross-culturally as we increasingly are uh, these days in a multi-faith society there are different understandings of disease and health that uh, create barriers so there are barriers in the patient's life and there are barriers in the doctor's life that we need to be aware of so let's move on now to look at the five keys to spiritual influence and each one of these begins with the letter c to make them more easy to remember but first of all there is competence spiritual influence requires professional competence if we want people to pay attention to our faith we must first pay attention to our work people don't care if you're a good person just until they know that you are a good doctor and we know that excellence is a very important value in the kingdom of god that we are called to be the best in our profession that we can which is 
why it's so important that we take our opportunities to study hard at medical school and during our postgraduate training and that we take care that we we do our job well there's nothing that spoils a good witness uh, worse than that a doctor who is incompetent or uh, doesn't care or does a bad job so as paul says to the colossians whatever you do work at it with all your heart remembering it's the lord you're serving not a human master and then spiritual influence requires a christ-like character so you can be the best doctor possible but if you're not attractive personally if you don't display the fruit of the holy spirit if you don't communicate that you are approachable then uh, people will not open up to you and you will not have the opportunity to speak to them and we're talking here about about christ likeness the big question what would jesus do but it's not just about actions it's actually in the way that we come across that we are uh, non-judgmental that we have servant hearts that we are humble in the way we approach it that we're the kind of person that engenders trust so that people can open their hearts up to us so professional competence a christ-like character and then the third key is compassion compassion is the logical end of grace if we really believe that god is the god of compassion and grace that he shows his love to us as unworthy sinners then we will uh, do the same thing to others and it involves both our speech and our actions both the things we say and the things we we do and you can destroy an opportunity to share faith through not being compassionate and i remember one uh, incident in my own uh, medical training you know which i'm quite ashamed of i was looking after a patient who had uh, a fractured tibia and a lot of soft tissue damaged and i put him into an external fixator to put his bones back together and allow the soft tissue time to heal and we uh, it the bones actually slipped within the external fixator and we had to after the time of the operation after putting the pins in take him back again to straighten up the leg and i was quite new to this i didn't appreciate quite how much pain there would be in doing it and uh, i gave him what i thought was an adequate pain relief dose but it clearly wasn't and even though i got the leg straight and did a good job with the bones i i hurt this man and i and i said to him please forgive me for doing this but i didn't say it in a very compassionate way and it wasn't until a few days later that i learned how much i'd upset him i had to go and really sincerely apologize to that patient to mend the relationship so we've got to be compassionate as well remember god who comforts us so that we might comfort others and then there's uh, wise communication it's not good enough to just to live a good life there was a, a missionary doctor in thailand who had served there for many years and was known by the uh, people in the surrounding area as a good buddhist because he never talked about his faith um, you know, St. Francis said, I share my faith with everybody and occasionally I use words as if to imply that all we have to do is live a good moral life. I know people who said that when they get to heaven, they're going to find St. Francis and strangle him because people have used his words as an excuse for not speaking. And so we do need to speak as well as to, to act, but that communication needs to be wise and seasoned with salt, with gentleness and respect, as Peter says. And then the final C, spiritual influence requires courage. And that's because uh, when we pray, God will open opportunities to share faith, but then we have to grasp them. And that requires us to be wise, but also it needs us to be bold and to take a step of faith and to face our fears and to take a risk. Uh, it always involves that. And this is why even the apostles had to pray for boldness because they were afraid to share their faith even when god created opportunities so we need to realize that boldness is something that the holy spirit gives us and to pray for it but be willing to step out in faith and take the opportunities that god gives so we've looked there at the barriers to faith we've looked at the five keys to to uh, spiritual influence and then the saline process course will go on to teach you over the course of a day of eight different uh, tools 
for, for witnesses, things that you can use in the context of a consultation. And we haven't got time to look at any of these in detail today. And we certainly don't have time to look at all of them, but I want to look briefly at the first four of these. And so that's prayer, questions, spiritual history taking, and, and faith flags. So first of all, uh, prayer. And when we were talking just before the seminar, we were talking about the webinar that Chris Stain from HCFI recently did on prayer. Very, very practical. And isn't it amazing that the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Colossians asked these relatively young Christians to pray for him that God, in the text here, would open a door for the message that we could proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. He was in prison at the time, pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. And so uh, Paul, even though with his great experience and great ability as an apostle, God-given ability, he still recognized that he was powerless to do anything unless God created opportunities for him to share his faith. And so he asked these, these Colossians to pray for an open door for the message. And the Holy Spirit loves prayers like this and he will open the doors. And it might be just once or twice a week or, or maybe once a day. Uh, it's not gonna happen with every patient. And we shouldn't be under the pressure thinking that unless I've shared my faith or said something spiritual or let this patient know I'm a Christian that I've somehow failed. No, it's, it's gonna be uh, much less frequent than that. But the good thing about it is that if God hasn't opened the door and created an opportunity, then uh, you shouldn't try and walk through it but if he has you need to have the courage to use it and so we pray for our workplace our patients our colleagues uh, um, uh, with our colleagues and, and for our patients uh, as well so prayer is incredibly important my uh, my brother my younger brother used to be the the general secretary of the IFES movement in New Zealand many many years ago and when he was a student there was a another fellow student he was sharing, uh, wanting to share his faith with, but he just didn't know how to, to start. And he was quite exercised by this. And, and one day he was in the library thinking about it and he just, he stood up uh, in front of the shelf of books and he, he prayed to the Lord, uh, Lord, you know, I just don't know how to share my faith with, with uh, John. Um, and you've really got to help me. I, I haven't got a clue how to do it. Give me a steer in this. And so uh, he then opened his eyes and turned around and there was John. This guy was just there right next to him. And he was very glad, my brother at that time, that he hadn't prayed out loud. He just prayed in his mind. And, um, and uh, he said, oh, hello, John. And John said, hello, Andy, um, I've been looking for you. Um, I've been wanting to ask you some time about your faith. And I wonder, you know, could we get a coffee or, or something sometime? You're probably very busy now studying, but at some stage, would that be possible? He was absolutely blown away, but God was answering his prayer even before he prayed it, bringing John to that very place. So God loves prayers to open opportunities. And there will sometimes be an opportunity to pray with patients. It's much more common with Christian patients, uh, but sometimes others will ask us too. One of my classmates back in, New Zealand, who was a Christian and, and had a really Christ-like character, a very compassionate person that she'd impress uh, this patient. There was a, a young man and his wife, he had cancer and was looking at a, a terminal problem. And uh, one day she was talking with them and uh, talking with them and they said, look, uh, we've been talking a lot and um, we realize that we really haven't thought about these spiritual issues of life after death at all. We know that you're a Christian because of, of um, the way you live and the things we've said, and we wonder would it be possible for you to, to uh, talk to us about it and to pray with us as we face this surgery. You know? And so God will open opportunities, but we need to be sensitive, never force them upon patients. So that's the first tool, prayer. And then the second one is, is questions. And questions, of course, are very biblical. God asks lots of questions. You go right back to the book of Genesis. He's asking questions, isn't he? Very searching questions, like to Adam and Eve. Who told you that you were naked? Or to, to Cain, where is your brother? 
or you get to the book of Job and he, he spends three chapters asking questions at the end of that book, which no one, which Job certainly can't answer. <clears throat> and Jesus was always asking uh, questions too. Who do people say that I am? And often he was asking questions that people couldn't answer. And uh, the good thing about questions is that they draw people out and it's much better to ask questions than to make statements often because uh, they're also important for building relationships and uh, establishing trust. And they help to get us to get to know our patients and, and how to help them when we understand actually where they're coming from. I ha had the dramatic uh, example of this once when I was working as a surgical trainee in the accident emergency department and I had a patient come in to the ward who had uh, just been pulled out of a car that they, they had reversed the exhaust and tried to kill themselves with carbon monoxide uh, fumes. And um, it was a really tragic story. This, this man, uh, his, his, um, his children, or one of his children had been drowned in an accident and, and he felt he was personally responsible for this. And uh, it was a long, long process that uh, he eventually decided to take his life. And, the, the amazing thing is that he set this up and then the car stalled and the engine stopped running and someone walking along the cliff saw the car with the smoke coming out and pulled him out and brought him into hospital. So I had to look after him. So I did all the usual blood tests and things, but I felt the Lord saying to me, hey, you've got to do a bit more than this. And I, I want you to go and, and talk to him. And I said, well, what, what should I ask him? And I didn't hear a, an audible voice, but it just came back to me, ask him if he believes in God. I, I said, God, that's a stupid question. I can't ask him that. He said, no, just, just ask him that, see what happens. So I went in and I said, you know, it may seem a, uh, could I ask you a personal question? He said, yeah. He said, um, may seem a silly question, but do you believe in God? And he looked straight at me and he said, you know, it's really funny you should ask that question because that's the whole problem. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, last night I said to God, I'm going to kill myself. You just try and stop me. And I said, well, that's a pretty dangerous prayer to pray because it looks to me like he probably did stop you because the car stalled and your life was saved and you're, you're in here. And he said, yeah, it's kind of looking like that. Isn't it? So we, we talked for about half an hour over all sorts of things before he went off to the psychiatry department. But it was a question that opened it up. Uh, ask searching questions of people. And that brings us on to the whole question of spiritual histories. And we're all familiar with taking the history, the history of the, the present illness, the family history, the social history, all, all the sorts of different, the history of, the, the, um, uh, of uh, past medications and past uh, illnesses and so on. So we're used to taking histories, but have you ever thought about spiritual histories? Now, I have a good friend who used to be the professor of uh, palliative medicine in an Australian medical school, and he used to teach undergraduate students. And he'd say, you cannot practice palliative medicine properly unless you're caring for the whole person, because it's not just about bodies, it's about minds and souls and spirits as well. And so you've got to take a spiritual history. And so he would teach these students who were from all kinds of ethnicities and cultures and, and faith backgrounds, and uh, a lot of them were atheists as well, how to take a spiritual history and therefore care for the whole person, body, mind, and soul. And uh, taking a spiritual history enables you to discover spiritual risk factors to help patients cope with sickness and pain and to enhance healthcare outcomes as well. well. We'll come on to the specifics of it very shortly, but it's also a way to discover barriers that there might be to spiritual conversation, but it could also open opportunities for spiritual conversation later. And uh, when can you take a spiritual history? Well, you can take one just in the course of um, a normal history taking exercise to, to drop in one or two questions. We'll, we'll look at those specific questions shortly. But uh, these are good times, health maintenance examinations, when you're uh, doing a physical check on someone, asking a whole lot of questions uh, of them. 
especially at times of major illness, terminal disease, when people are thinking about the big questions about life, the universe and everything, what might happen after death, or they may have fears or vulnerabilities that they're expressing. In the perioperative period, and uh, as a surgeon, of course, you see a person um, in the outpatient clinic, it's often very, uh, very busy. You see them in the pre-op ward round, but it's actually in the post-operative and perioperative period afterwards when there's far less pressure of time and you're doing your rounds, perhaps in the evening, evening round by yourself, that you have time to pause and ask deeper questions and get into conversation or at times of social crisis or times of loss, especially in times of bereavement, usually not in the acute stage, but uh, later on when there's a, a chance. Remember to follow the leading of the, the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you take a spiritual history? Well, it's not, a, it's not a long exercise because it's often just one or, you know, maybe two questions that you put into your social history as you're asking the questions. So you ask them about what their mother and father died of, any diseases that run in the family, um, the, the, the social background to know what support they need when they go going home. <clears throat> and to ask a question either about belief or practice or faith community. So here are, here are some great questions. Do you have a faith which helps you? Uh, you can add in a time like this, or you can add further, or, or you're not really interested in these sorts of things. Now, um, you'd be amazed at what comes out there. Oh no, I don't really have a faith. Oh yeah, I'm, I, I was once a Catholic. Oh, my wife's a Christian, or something like that. Do you have a personal faith? what's important to you personally, but do you have a faith that helps you? Or another question even more uh, vague might be, uh, you know, what keeps you going? Um, practice, how does it affect your life? How does, uh, if you do have a faith that helps you, um, has it, how has it impacted your life in terms of the way that you make decisions or think about things? or uh, more directly, have you ever prayed about your situation? Or um, do you belong to a faith community? Um, that's a very open question. Oh, I'm a Buddhist, or I'm a Muslim or something. Uh, it gives you information that you can go back to later, or who gives you support? You know, what, what, when you're in a difficult situation, where do you find support? And people might say, oh, well, it's my wife that really supports me or I have a brother I can talk to about anything or it might be well actually at my church it might be at the tennis club but whatever you're asking you're going to get information and you don't have to pick these things up there and then you just tuck them away you might record them in the notes because they're part of the history that is relevant but it may be in going back to a patient later that you have an opportunity to pick it up or perhaps they will pick it up it's not unusual that they that they do and that brings us on to the final thing that we've got time to look at today, and that's the whole question of faith flags. And a faith flag is something that you say or do in the context of a consultation that simply identifies you as a member of God's family. That's all it does. It does not uh, leave the patient with any obligation to make a response. You're just throwing something out. And it might be as simple as something that you're wearing. You're wearing a, a fish a badge, for example, on your, on your uh, coat or on your shirt. Or it might be that in the uh, surgery, in the, in the practice room, you have a, a verse uh, on a poster on the wall. Or it might be that you, you say, oh, well, last weekend, uh, the family around and after, after church on a Sunday, we went for a picnic. All you're doing is signifying that you're a member of God's family. Or you might just say something like, well, the man upstairs was kind to me this morning. I found a parking place or something. So it's, it's very brief, not more than 20 seconds. And it creates opportunities because whereas there might be no response, what you have done is communicated to this person that you are a person to whom faith is important. And it's very important that faith flags, they shouldn't be a spiritual turnoff, uh, uh, using theological language or jargon or identifying you with 
denominations or groups, you know, I'm a Methodist or I'm a, an Anglo-Catholic or something like that. It's, it's it, what you're really trying to convey is that you're a person who has a relationship with God and you're, you're a member of a faith community and that's important to you. And it shouldn't be a legalistic thing where you're, you're, you're saying, well, you know, I'm a Christian, I don't drink, or I'm a Christian, I don't um, you know, dance, or I don't uh, go watch that kind of film or something. So, so not, not negative things, but things that are just demonstrating that you're a person to whom your faith is important. No more than that. And that will give opportunities later. And then just finally, just to sum up some of these things that we've been saying. So we've looked at the opportunities and barriers that that um, arise in the patient doctor or patient dentist consultation. We've looked at the, the keys to spiritual influence, the five C's, and then we've looked at four different tools that we can use from, um, from prayer to asking questions to taking a spiritual history and then faith flag. So uh, important to explore the personal background of your patients. You know, the man who comes in, I'm thinking of one patient here with multiple lower limb fractures uh, because he'd been hit by a car crossing the road. And it wasn't, it was only because I asked deeper questions about the circumstances that I'd re I realized that this man had wandered across the road and not seen the car because he was drunk. And that he was drunk because he just had a fight with his wife. And so he'd gone to the pub to drown his sorrows. And it had a, a fight with his wife because she realized and had just confronted him over the fact that he was having an affair and it was ripping their marriage apart. So it wasn't just broken bones, there was a whole story behind this man. But listen for expressions of, of felt needs often patients will give you a clue. Don't react negatively to objections that people have. Remember that it takes a long time for people to make the journey of faith. And you might be just one small link in the chain. Recognize the value of doubt. When uh, people first have to doubt their sincerely held beliefs before they can imagine that Christianity might have something to offer. Answer their sincere questions recognizing that not all questions are sincere. Some of them are just uh, designed to put you off. Turn their questions into a faith story. Now we haven't touched on that, but a faith story is one of the other tools where you'll take a little bit longer, a couple of minutes or so to tell a personal story about yourself when given the opportunity that demonstrates the importance of your faith to you. One faith story I used to use was that um, when I was a young man, I was driving a car with four people in it and I went too fast on a bend down a hill with very loose gravel on the road and I lost control of the car and rolled it down a hill. And amazingly, we were all uh, safe and no one was, was injured, but I learned some very important lessons from that. And I certainly learned uh, that to be much more compassionate towards patients who ended up in the intensive care department and not to make judgments about them recognizing my own frailty but I, I also from that incident recognized that we could so easily have been killed and that God uh, must have had plans in keeping us alive and that we should make sure that we found out what those plans were and make our lives count so that that would be an example of a faith story that you could tell think about things in your own life where God has been important or uh, taught you something. And then there might be opportunities for investigation together. Now, it might be that you make a referral to the church or to a, a chaplain or something, or it might be an opportunity to uh, look at the Bible together with, with patients, again, with sensitivity, with their permission and with respect. So that's a very quick uh, survey through sharing faith with patients.